Hey, CT fam. We are so glad that you have joined us for service online today. Today, Pastor Mays is starting week five of his sermon series called This Is The Way. Each week has been so good, so if you haven't seen the other four parts, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. I promise they will be challenging and really help you in your walk with Christ. So stay tuned for some worship, an awesome word, but before we get started, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we welcome your presence into this place. God, we pray that you would move through every single person that's watching online today. God, that they would feel your presence in a new and real way today. God, that you would bless this series. God, that we could just encounter you today and feel your presence through the rest of this week. Amen.
All my words fall short I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is an hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Alleluia Alleluia I've got a wondrous fun I've got just one move is why I will worship you so I put up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is the hallelujah hallelujah I know it's not much I've got Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy.
Thanks again for joining us here at Calvary Temple Online. We love to connect with you each and every week. Hey, grab your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 6. We're going to be looking there today as we continue in our series, This is the Way. Mark chapter 6. I've been trying to find some memes that I can relate to, and I'm kind of hoping that you can relate to them as well. This first one's pretty funny. It said, I did a cartwheel the other day thinking it was like riding a bike. It's not. By the way, I noticed the typo in the meme as well, just in case you're looking and notice that. Um, I didn't create the meme, just so you know, but I thought that was actually made it even more funny that it was misspelled. And this is something I could relate to, I thought was funny. Some of you may not get this for a little while, but if you look at it close enough, I think you'll get it, you know, because I grew up playing horseshoes and such, so I thought it was kind of funny. And then this one, you know, I'm thinking of starting a hide-and-seek team, but good players are hard to find. True true. Well, there was a little girl who had been trying for about a month or so to learn the art of tying her shoes, and she finally grasped the knack of it, and she was able to do it all by herself. Well, her parents expected her to be delighted, but they were actually surprised by her disappointment. Her father asked her why she was crying, and she sobbed, I, I just learned how to tie my shoes. He said, honey, that's wonderful, but, but why are you crying? She replied back, well, because now I have to do it all by myself for the rest of my life. You know, growing up sometimes can be difficult, can it? Hey, let's pray before we get into this passage today. Father, we thank you today for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this incredible example that you have 
given us to be able to follow, to be able to be like you, to be able to to lead people into a relationship with you so they can see you in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd speak through this mouthpiece today, challenge us and change us, and we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed how people love to tell about their brushes with greatness or really at least their brushes with celebrity? For example, my son Gabriel, he lives out in Burbank, California, and he works in the film and camera industry, and he's always got a good story. I mean, every so often he'll run into a Hollywood celebrity or, you know, he'll help out a famous producer or director. In fact, a few weeks ago, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez stopped by his shop to pick up some gear for a project they were doing. I mean, he's always running into somebody out there. You know, there's a guy on Facebook who posted how that he was in the doctor's office and in walks Sting. One guy commented back and he said, Sting the bass player from the police? He said, no, Sting the wrestler. Now, I don't think the guy that made the comment realized that there was a wrestler named Sting, and I'm not necessarily sure that the guy that posted the post to begin with had ever heard of the band called The Police. I mean, celebrity can be so subjective sometimes, can't it? It's amazing, though, how fascinated we become with a, a, a little small-time exposure to fame, right? In fact, there's a, a Seinfeld episode in which George Costanza, he buys a car only because he thinks that it used to be owned by John Voight, the actor. Well, it turns out it was actually owned by John Voight, the dentist. Not quite as glamorous, is it? You know, I haven't really known that many famous people in my life, but my wife, Marcia, was born in a small town in Indiana whose claim to fame was John Cougar Mellencamp, his big uh, hits, number one hits, include songs like Small Town, Heard So Good, Jack and Diane, and, and, and many others. Well, anyway, Marcia and he were born in the same hospital in Seymour, Indiana. In fact, they actually have a, a huge mural of John Cougar Mellencamp on the side of one of the downtown buildings there. You know, I remember seeing John Cougar for the very first time. I, I think it was on The Tonight Show. But anyway, I had never heard of him before that time. But after that, it seems like his career just really took off and began to soar. You know, some celebrities are like that. They sneak up on fame. Nobody's ever heard of them. I mean, one minute they're, they're, they're nobodies, and, and then the next minute everybody knows them. Now, this is probably where any comparison between John Cougar and Jesus would end. But that's how Jesus was. You know, we don't know much about the first 30 years of Jesus' life, but we know that many people who, who knew him during those years did not realize that they were in the presence of greatness. They didn't expect him to become famous. They didn't realize that he was anointed of God. I mean, he walked among them. He lived among them. He worked among them. He, he you know, worshiped with them. He fellowshiped with them. They had no clue who he really was. Well, we're in this series of messages called This is the Way. This is the way as we're following the example of Jesus. We are taking a look here today at, at, at a scene in Jesus' life. In fact, we've been looking at various scenes in Jesus' life that gives us insight into who he was and, wh and what he was like. Now, today's story found here in Mark chapter 6 gives us a glimpse of Jesus from a different angle. Now, in this story, we see many folks didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah or the Son of God or really even a great prophet. They only saw him as a carpenter or just as Mary's son. They didn't see him as a prophet, but, but only as a mere carpenter. I mean, they thought they knew him. They thought that they had him sized up, but he was nothing like they imagined him to be. And so they never really took him seriously. And as a result, they missed out on experiencing God's blessings in their lives. Now, here's the story. Look with me at Mark chapter 6, verse number 1. Jesus left that part of the country and returned to his, with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. Now the next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed, he's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people. Now today, I, I want us to see how the people of Jesus' hometown, Nazareth here, 
completely missed out on knowing Jesus in a meaningful way. They dismissed him as just a nobody. And we're going to consider how that we can avoid making the same mistake. Now, first of all, I want you to notice that they had trouble accepting him because, number one, he didn't fit their stereotype of greatness. Have you ever known someone who thinks that, you know, they're all that? I mean, they just really think that they're something else. You know, they think they're better than everyone else. They think that they can do things better than everyone else. They think that they look better or they live better than everyone else. Now, now they aren't and they can't, but in their own mind, they think they are. You know, they're really just a nobody trying to be a somebody, you know, trying to act like they're somebody. Now, Jesus is just the opposite. I mean, you see the trees outside of your windows? He created them. The blue skies, he spoke them into existence. He made them all. In fact, John chapter 1, verse 3 says, God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Jesus is the creator of the universe, and yet he entered into the world through a stable, and he spent years of his life in obscurity in, the, in a backwoods Galilean village of Nazareth, just working with his hands as a humble carpenter. Now, everyone knows a nobody who tries to act like a somebody, but Jesus was the opposite. He was a somebody who acted like a nobody. And because of this, many people in his own hometown couldn't accept him. Mark writes it this way in verses 2 and 3. Many who heard him were amazed. They said, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed, he's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Now, in effect, what they were saying is, what gives this guy the right to speak and act like a prophet? I mean, we know him. We know his family. He's just a carpenter. Now, this was a major obstacle for them. Now, first century Jewish culture was one in which social mobility was really quite limited. Most people could expect to live their entire lives within the confines of the class in which they were born. I mean, blue-collar workers were expected to remain blue-collar, and construction workers didn't frequently become statesmen. You know, also, it was an obstacle, though, I think, because as one theologian wrote, that familiarity with him is a hindrance to knowing him truly, for it makes it all the more difficult to see through the veil of his ordinariness. Now, people are oftentimes attracted to an image. You know, not a reality, but an image. They want to believe in and they want to follow the image. Not the ordinary, down-to-earth reality of who that person actually is. In fact, conference promoters are very familiar with this principle. I mean, if you can't get an expert, then fly in an outsider and everyone will think that he's an expert. You know, Bob's here tonight to talk about marketing. You know, this should be good because Bob came all the way from Cleveland. You know, we do this with Christian celebrities. I mean, we tend to think that Jimmy Swaggart and Max Lucado, Chuck Swindoll, Rick Warren, Stephen Furtick, Joel Osteen, and all the rest of them are somehow different than us. You know, that, that they're better than us, that they have kind of like high, a high-speed connection with God, and we're still here on dial-up. Now, each of these men go out of their way to emphasize that they struggle just like the rest of us, but we don't easily believe them. You know, I've also seen this happen in Christian music with worship leaders. You know, if any genre of music could be immune to celebrityism, I believe it's worship music. And yet somehow, some people think that they, can't, that they can worship God better if it's Chris Tomlin or Phil Wickham or Brandon Lake behind the microphone instead of a nobody. And that's because our society today is really just like the culture in, Je in Jesus' day, right where Jesus lived. We want celebrities. We want heroes. We want to worship an image. And it, it becomes difficult to see through the veil of ordinariness. You know, in discovering and following Jesus, we need to realize that he is truly human. I mean, he didn't just float through life. I mean, he became one of us. He lived like one of us. And, and when he walked the streets uh, and, and the dusty roads of, uh, 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 of Israel in sandals, his feet became dirty just like everybody else's did. Working as a carpenter, his callous hands were covered with scrapes and blisters and splinters. I mean, when he was hungry, his stomach growled. When he breathed in the dusty air, he sneezed. And when he was tired, he needed to sleep. You see, he was fully human, 100% fully human. You know, most people aren't prepared to acknowledge that. 
They see Jesus as some sort of half man, half ghost, but he was nothing like that. He was 100% fully human when he walked on this earth, and he was 100% fully God. The people of Nazareth couldn't accept Jesus because he didn't fit their stereotype. He doesn't fit the stereotype that we try to put him in either. You know, for those of you that expect God to be whatever you conceive him to be, you're going to have trouble with Jesus because you can't create him in your image. He is not a better version of you. You don't get your own personal Jesus. I mean, it seems like everybody tries to squeeze Jesus into their mold, but he doesn't easily fit in that mold. You see, God's not just a slightly better, slightly smarter version of you. He is infinite. He is glorious. And an encounter with him won't just change the way that you think about your faith. It'll change your entire life. See, if you developed your image of Jesus from any place other than the Gospels, you probably have some misconceptions about him. And that's why I'm challenging you to rediscover the Jesus of the Gospels. Discover him for yourself. Because through the Gospels, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see a man that is alive with the power of God. You'll see how he cares for children and the weak and the helpless and how he has compassion on those who hurt and how he shows mercy to those that have sinned and, 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 and has little tolerance for arrogance and self-righteousness. You see how sometimes he speaks harshly. And sometimes he speaks gently. Sometimes he doesn't speak at all. I mean, Jesus is sometimes hard to pin down. And quite frankly, that's why I encourage you to experience him yourself through the pages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you know, since Jesus isn't easily stereotyped, I want you to realize, secondly, that he's often unfairly dismissed. He is often unfairly dismissed. Now, because Jesus didn't fit the image the people of his hometown had in mind of what a prophet of God should be like, they dismissed him. They dismissed him. In fact, the Bible says there in verse number three, they were offended at him. Jesus' response was in verse four, prophets are honored by everyone except the people in their hometown and their relatives and their own family. You know, when a friend of mine, Steve, moved to Jackson, Tennessee in 1980, he was very impressed to find out that this is where Carl Perkins is from. In fact, Carl Perkins was alive at the time that he moved there. Now, for those of you that don't know Carl Perkins, he's really considered the king of rockabilly. He wrote songs like Blue Suede Shoes, Matchbox, Honey Don't, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, and Mama Sang Bass, among many, many others. The Beatles recorded some of his songs. In fact, when the Beatles met Carl Perkins while he was on tour in England back in the early 60s, they were starstruck. John Lennon even called him Mr. Perkins, even though they were about the same age. Now, to those interested in the early history of rock and roll music, Carl Perkins is a legend. And and being an avid music fan, my friend Steve couldn't believe that he lived in the same town as Carl Perkins. In fact, his house was just a few blocks away from Steve's. Steve was more than a little starstruck. Now, some of Steve's musicianal friends uh, from out of town were even worse than him. They said, man, you live near Carl Perkins? I mean, you actually see him around town sometimes? And Steve would say, oh, yeah, all the time. In fact, I drove by his house the other day, and he was out mowing his front yard in bright yellow Bermuda shorts and no shirt. Oh, wow, they would say, you know. You know, what's most amazing, though, is that Carl Perkins never got the respect that he deserved locally. I mean, many of the musicians there in, in that town, they dismissed him. They made fun of his, his, his toupee. They criticized his music. They called him a hack, which really is what unsuccessful musicians frequently call successful musicians. And even though he did a lot of great charity work there in Jackson, he established a foundation for child abuse and others, he didn't get the respect he deserved. I mean, here was a guy who had number one hit after number one hit. He traveled around the world with a band. He performed with Eric Clapton and Elvis Presley, Paul McCartney, Roy Orbison, and and a host of other people. And he was often unfairly dismissed. Why? Why? Well, mainly because he was just a local guy. And you know, this is how people saw Jesus, though clearly the stakes for dismissing him were much higher. I mean, his words weren't taken seriously. He wasn't given the hearing that he deserved because, you know, to them, he was just a local guy. Nobody special, no big celebrity, just a carpenter. I mean, just Mary's son, just James's brother. And, and they never really heard what he had to say. 
You know, even Jesus' own family didn't take him seriously. In fact, Mark wrote about the crowds that were following Jesus. And then he said in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. Now, can you imagine people so close to Jesus having so little understanding? Can you imagine living right there with him, having him near you, being able to talk to him anytime, being able to listen to his teaching anytime, and not having a clue about who he is? Well, guess what? This is the way that we're like the people in Nazareth, really. I mean, we dismiss Jesus far too easily today, too. We allow ourselves to become immune to his teaching, and we sometimes find ourselves not taking him seriously. You know, he calls for radical discipleship, for total commitment, for complete uh, obedience. And, but, but we try to, to maintain a casual relationship with him. He says that we are to be forgiven as we forgive others. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. But you know what? We continue to nurture unforgiveness toward others. He said in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, all things are possible to him who believes. But we continue to nurture doubt. He said in Mark chapter 12, verse 17, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And yet we often do our best to render to neither what they have a right to receive. He said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, and yet we complain that there's never enough. And he said in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And yet we keep on looking to the things of this world to satisfy our hunger and to quench our thirst. I mean, we know his words. We can repeat his words, but sometimes we're reluctant to believe his words. When you rediscover the Jesus of the Gospels, you encounter one who cannot be dismissed, one whose words are life and truth. You know, the tragedy is that Jesus is often dismissed by those who should know him the best. Let's not make that mistake. Because the third thing I want to point out is because dismissing Jesus means that you miss out on his power. You know, Mark makes a very interesting statement here in verse number five. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, I got to tell you, at first glance, this verse appears to say that their unbelief somehow limited Jesus' power, as if Jesus is made weak in the midst of unbelief, you know, where there's not much belief, he's, he's not very powerful, almost kind of like uh, in, in that movie Elf, where the sleigh is powered by the cheer of the people, right? But I want you to understand, that's not it. This is it. Jesus healed those who were brought to him. He healed everyone that was brought to him, but because of the unbelief of the people in his hometown, only a few people were brought to him. It wasn't that he tried to heal people and he couldn't do it because he didn't have the power to do it. It was that he never had the opportunity to do it. You can't heal many people in a room full of empty chairs. You know, Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them, the scripture said, because the people never gave him a chance. They stayed home. The sick didn't come asking to be healed. The blind didn't come asking to see. The oppressed didn't come asking to be delivered. They just didn't come. They stayed away. And he marveled at their unbelief. You see, when you dismiss Jesus, when you fail to take him seriously, you miss out on his power. You know, he has made his power available to you. He wants to fill your life with joy and peace and happiness. He wants to help you through your struggles and move the mountains that stand in your way to defeat the enemies that oppress you and overcome those obstacles that are before you. His power is available to you. Don't dismiss his words as just, oh, that's a good verse, or it's just some sort of religious talk or wishful thinking. I challenge you now to see through the veil of familiarity that sometimes prevents us from encountering the real Jesus. And I challenge you to take him at his word. Come to him in faith, believing that he'll heal you, that he'll deliver you, that, that he'll do what only he can do in your life. Don't dismiss Jesus and miss out on his power. You know, in closing, hockey great Wayne Gretzky used to say this, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Now, there's a spiritual application to this principle. You get zero answers to the prayers that you never pray. You miss out on 100% of the miracles that you never ask for. And so today, I'm urging you, don't let yourself miss out on knowing Jesus and on experiencing his blessings in your life. Don't dismiss him and miss out on your miracle. 
Don't settle for the Jesus that you think you know. Get to know the real Jesus. Read his stories. Listen to his teachings. Ask him to make himself known to you. And I'll tell you what, the more you know him, the more that you can take him at his word and the more you'll experience his power in your life. Don't miss out. Don't dismiss him. You know, today, maybe you've never opened your heart to him. Jesus Christ came and he gave his life on the cross of Calvary so that he could pay the price for your sins. It was the only way your sins could be forgiven, totally and completely. He did that to pay the sins, the price for the sins of everyone, every single person, once and for all. Today, he's offering to you that forgiveness. He's offering to you a relationship with him, a relationship with your heavenly father, to, to, to be able to know that his power is with you everywhere that you go. And that when you pray, your prayers are being heard. If you never opened your heart or life to him, I want to encourage you just to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you willingly gave your life to pay the price for my sins. I receive your forgiveness right now. I ask you to come into my life and to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to begin an intimate relationship with you right here and right now. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, just say, Pastor, in the, in the comment section, put, Pastor, I prayed that prayer because we want to rejoice and celebrate with you as well. You know, for many others, I just want to encourage you again, don't miss out. Don't become so familiar with Jesus like those in his hometown that you dismiss him, that you dismiss him in any way. Don't miss out on what God's wanting to do. Don't miss out on experiencing him and experiencing his power in your life. And so as we close in prayer, let's ask God to never let us get so casual and so familiar with him to the point that we don't take him seriously, that we don't experience all of, the, all of him in every day. So Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for this passage. But we don't want to be like the people of Nazareth that day. We don't ever want to become numb. We don't ever want to become so familiar in, the, in that manner anyway. Lord, we want to become familiar in our relationship with you and that we get to know you more and more and more. We just don't want to ever become so familiar that we take you for granted. That we, that we just assume we know everything about you. Lord, help us to continue to learn more about you each and every day, to not dismiss you in any way, but to, to, to just allow you to work in our life. Jesus, we ask you to touch our lives and help us to experience you in a greater way in each and every day, each and every moment that we'll experience you and we'll know you more and more and more so that we can be Jesus with skin to everyone that we come in contact with so they can experience you as well. We give you the praise, the glory, and all the honor for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next week.